you know, I get a lot of very nice amps here, uh, vintage amps, high-end amps, and, you know, I feature them on the channel because, you know, uh, at our core, I think most of us are still 12-year-olds drooling over uh, magazines. Gas is a real thing. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, vintage amps are fantastic. High-end amps are fantastic. But the world runs on the Blues Juniors and the Hot Rod DeVilles and the Blues Deluxes and the PV Classic 50s and 30s. This is a PV Classic 30. And, you know, I've got a 64 Super Reverb here. Fantastic amp. I have found that a lot of the players who have vintage amps have more than one. That, you know, they begin to have a collection. Most of the guys out there who are playing Classic 30s, Blues DeVilles, etc., that's their amp. That's the one. And so I feel that I have a responsibility to treat these inexpensive and very common apps just as seriously seriously as I do the esoteric, the, the vintage, the rare, whatever. So um, I want to show you some common issues on the Classic 30 um, and why they're a little bit of a challenge to work on. Uh, even though they're an inexpensive amp, uh, there's a lot of labor involved just to access everything. It's not a... It's a convenient design for PV to manufacture. It's not a convenient design to service. Um, and then I'll show you uh, a few things that I did once you come back from seeing that, that stuff. So enjoy the show. This is a good old PV Classic 30. And it has common issues. Missing a, a knob. I think I've got some PV knobs for this series. Dirty as hell. And uh, it came in with only two output tubes in place on one side and a whole bunch of other output tubes rattling around in the back of the cab and they were all, all of them had lost vacuum. So I don't know whether it's just vibration that did that or if this amp has been eating tubes. I'm not gonna feed it any other tubes until I know what's going on inside it. When I was trying to pull the chassis, it was really tricky because uh, the metal here on this flange, on this panel has bent out. So I've got to bend that in so that when I put these uh, screw retainer clips back in place. They won't wedge up against the Tolex on insertion, which means that this thing moves and then the screw never lines up, etc., etc. That's a fairly easy mechanical repair. So, uh, missing a knob. I've got those PV knobs. Dusty. Those cap, those filter caps are always suspicious in these things after a while and they got gobs of glue, which make uh, changing components in these amps much more difficult than it otherwise would be. And the real joy of this series is that you have that U-shaped uh, setup with three boards. And it's uh, got to take everything out on the top and bottom of the amp to pull those boards. And uh, each one of these little wire jumpers is a place where things commonly go south. It only takes one bad solder joint. Sometimes it'll turn into arcing and get burns. But let me pull all this out and we'll see what's going on with this amp. And see where we're at as far as the, uh, whether feeding new tubes to it would be a good or bad thing. Okay, I got the board out. Before I do anything else, I'm going to clean off the uh, chrome panel. So I'll start with just getting the majority of the dust off with a dry paper towel. If it's really bad, I'll take it outside and use a brush. This isn't too bad. Once I get that to that level, I find that um, on this chrome surface with the white lettering, a little WD-40 does a good job of cleaning things up and doesn't remove the, uh, the silk screened lettering. Oops, almost, almost fell in my lap. I know this is real exciting to watch, but you know, if you pay to have your amp serviced, it's nice when it comes back clean. You know, it looks like you're getting your money's worth when you do that. It looks like the tech gave a damn. And uh, more importantly, especially on the uh, input jacks and the, these jacks here and the pots, getting all that dust off can keep things running better. I'll also clean out those jacks because as much dust was on the top of this surface, that's going to be down in those jacks. Make sure that all that's tight so that pilot light's loose. Power's good. Let me tighten up that pilot light. 
and uh, then get to the board itself. Okay, we're going to go through and inspect this. So, no visible leaks on those caps. This is one of the low voltage caps. It's not leaking, it's just got some paper towel or something wedged in there. That's odd. Let's see. It's hard to show on camera. I don't see any leakage there. That doesn't mean those caps are good. It just means they're not absolutely bad. I'll double check the values of these fuses, of course. Moving on. Yeah, definitely some heat in this issue. You can see the browning on the board, and we'll check the other side of that. You can see why this construction method is beloved of techs everywhere. Let me flip this over. Yeah, there is that browning where those resistors are. And that's fairly common for those resistors to generate a lot of heat. And the fix is to replace them with ones that are mounted off the board for some airflow. And uh, now moving on to the output sockets. See if I can get this to focus where I want. Some fugly looking solder joints there. Nothing intrinsically bad. I'm still a little bit suspicious of the filter caps in this amp. And uh, on this amp, there's some little, little bitty resistors in this area. I don't remember which ones they are now. I have to look them up. That on the schematic say they're, sorry about the shaky cam. On the schematic say they're one watts. And I think that is an optimistic rating. And uh, sometimes they burn. But I'm going to look at the schematic and find them. I don't recall which ones they are. Measure them. But they're in the low voltage supply, which is also the bias supply. So if the bias goes weird, output tubes die. And let me just confirm that that is, in fact, a bit of paper towel wedged in there. Yeah. Now, in a perfect world, I would replace all these large filter caps. Um, but I have to make sure that it's necessary first, because on this amp and some other PVs of this era, they've got this awful, awful glue everywhere. And you've got to chip it away and exacto it and heat it up, and it takes a long time to excavate and get the old stuff off in order to change the caps. So um, I cannot in good conscience insist on that unless it is absolutely necessary. Now, it may be that I just need to replace these resistors with some mounted farther off the board, touch up some solder joints, give everything a good cleaning, and uh, verify that the bias supply is good. So, one of the issues with working on this amp is that you cannot test things when it's like this because it's, it's, connect, it's not connected to the power transformer and there's no safe way to, to connect everything while it's out like this. I've done it in the past and it's really not safe um, and it's not optimal. I'm, PV would have had a test rig set up for this. So you've got to kind of have things in place to an extent because, you know, it's just a lot of stuff. There's no real good orientation for things on the bench. Anyway, I digress. Let me go through and get some parts necessary. I might have them in stock and then I'll know where I'm at. All right, now once all that was done, uh, this amp needed a few things. Uh, needed all the output tube socket uh, solder joints reflowed. All these little metal wires that join the three PCBs together to make this U-shape needed to have their uh, connections reflowed. And I tested each one of these because it's very common for these to break. Either the wire itself breaks or it begins to break at the solder joint. And on some of these connections, it'll cause arcing when that happens. Uh, these two 5-watt resistors here were mounted right up against the board, and the board was being baked. So I've got new 5-watt resistors, the same value, just mounted off the board for a little bit of airflow. That really helps. And then the Classic 30 and the Classic 50 design has an odd thing where a, one pair of output tubes has 100-ohm screen grid resistors, and the other pair does not. And it's a very strange thing to do, and there's not a lot of grid resistance either way. 
So instead of just having the, the stock thing where uh, one pair has screen grid resistors, the other does not, I gave each output tube an individual screen re grid resistor. You can see two here mounted where the stock ones were. There are two more on the PCB for the output tube socket, so I can't show once the amp is assembled. Um, and each one has a 1K uh, screen grid resistor as opposed to none or 100 ohms. So the output tube should last a lot longer. Um, it's got a new quad of JJ EL84s. Now, one of the problems with the Classic 30 and the Delta Blues, which is the same amp only with a 15 inch speaker and uh, tremolo added, is that the output tubes aren't very well protected. Uh, there's no wooden panel over them. They're held in place by some spring clips, which always come loose, often get lost. This amp has lost three of them. Uh, so if you own one of these amps, you know, look at this video, know all the things that a tech needs to do to be able to fix it, because it's a lot of labor to take the thing fully apart uh, properly and put it back together properly. But also know that you need to baby the amp when you're in transit. Don't let it bang into things in the back of your car. Don't let think, you know, don't put a pedal back there because you will damage your output tubes. Another oddity about this series in the Classic 50 is the heaters are in series. So if you have one tube uh, that fails, uh, to, uh, that's, that, that's pulled, you know, or has failed in some way, the heater supply to all the tubes will go out. So if you have one of these and all the tubes stay dark, don't panic, it's nothing big. You've got one bad tube or you pulled a tube or a tube is just loose. If uh, they're not heating, if one of them's not heating, none of them will heat because of the series connection. Anyway, after the end of all that, it sounds like a classic 30. <laughs> It's a little bit of a dark amp in stock form. The mids is a little bit aggressive, so you know, don't be afraid to turn the treble up a little bit. The boost is a little bit over the top. And the uh, drive isn't my favorite. weaknesses of this circuit is that if you EQ the drive to sound pretty good. So more mids, a little more treble, maybe tighten up the bass a little bit. Then the cleans sound a bit painful. It's not that the drive really sounds bad on this amp, but it's not fantastic. It's that once you EQ the amp to sound really nice for the clean stuff, which is how most people would use this, then the drive suffers. Just a little bit, you know. Um, so if you're in the studio, you can do a pass with the clean stuff, re-EQ it, do a pass with the dirty stuff. Live, there's a reason most people use overdrive pedals with these things. but. There's nothing wrong with a uh, meat and potatoes amp that's working properly, and this one is and should be working properly for a good long while. Sometime in the next 10 years, it will need uh, to have all the filter caps replaced, but that time is not now. Mm -hmm.